Hello and welcome to the 10th in a series of 12 lessons from Job presented from the British Bible School. In this particular study we will concentrate on Job's last speech after his friends have spoken from chapters 26 to 31. From 26 to 27 Job addressed his remarks to Bildad's most recent comments at first and he then goes on to include all three of his friends. Job began by rebuking Bildad's attitude in verses 1 to 4. These verses contain Job's harshest words against his friends, listing all the things his friends said he had done, or not done, for those in need, etc. He asks, when have you ever done that? Job's description of God's omnipotence in the following verses shows that he had much larger concept of God than Bildad had. Yet, his troubles cannot be explained without honestly facing the puzzling questions that his friends had actually overlooked. In verse 5, when it mentions the elite among the dead who trembled under the waters, that is in Sheol, because they are gods under God's authority, is speaking, as Isaiah 14 and verse 9 is, of those who are the great and the good and the powerful of the past. Sheol beneath is stirred up to meet you, when you come, it rouses the shades to greet you. All who were leaders of the earth, it raises from their thrones, all who were kings of the nations. Even these people, the greatest who have gone before, are in fear of God and tremble before him. We see the word Abaddon used, and this is a poetic equivalent for Sheol, and is used later on in Job, and also in Psalms 88 and verse 11. In verse 7 of uh, chapter 26, if the statement that God hangs the earth on nothing refers to the suspension of earth in space, then it preceded scientific discovery by thousands of years. It is not clear that Job himself would have understood the complete meaning of his own words. Some consider it a reference as to where the pagans thought their gods live, and Job is merely stating they don't exist. That place is empty. Nevertheless, the statement itself holds great truth. Scientific discovery always agrees with scientific facts that we find in the Bible. The Bible isn't written as a scientific textbook, but nothing that science has discovered has ever disagreed with what was written thousands of years before science discovered it. In an outline of chapter 26, we see that Job speaks of God's power over a knowledge of Sheol. He speaks of his creation of outer space and the earth, his control over the clouds, his delineating of the realms of light and darkness, his shaking of the mountains, his quelling of the sea, his destruction of Rahab and the serpent, which are both symbols of evil or pagan gods, used also in chapter 9 and verse 13. All these things about God merely scratch the surface of how great he really is. Job has an awareness of the incomprehensible power of God. In chapter 27, Job again affirms his innocence. Since verse 1 begins, then Job continued, it seems he might have paused for his friends to give an answer. Job might have waited for Zophar to respond, who hasn't spoken yet. However, we have no third speech by him in the text. Evidently, Job proceeded to elaborate further on Bildad's so-called wisdom, but broadened his perspective and addressed all three friends. Job began by affirming his innocence in the first six verses. For the first time, he actually took an oath as well that his words were true. As God lives, as it appears in the text, means that what he was saying was as certain as God's existence. Since his friends were wrong, Job assumed he was right. And that maybe is where Job made a mistake. If Job sinned at all, it was by being self-righteous. Job also, we're told from verses 7 to 23, wished that his enemies would suffer the fate of the wicked. 
his enemies probably being his three friends. Some writers have regarded verses 13 to 23 as Zophar's third speech because of the, the language that's used there, the way in which he speaks. However, this section is actually consistent with Job's argument in the immediate context and previously. This kind of rhetoric was a means of dealing with false accusations and oppression. Legally, if a false accusation is made, the punishment for that crime must then be given to the false accuser. His friends had falsely accused Job of being wicked. Therefore, he thought they deserved to be punished like the wicked, to be punished in the same way as him, because they're falsely accusing him of sins he's not committed. They painted a picture of the evildoer and put it in front of him like a mirror, so he could see himself in it. So now he turns it round and holds it in front of them, so that they can see and understand that his suffering does not match what he has actually done. He agreed with his companions that God does punish the wicked. This is what normally happens in life, from verses 13 to 23. Nonetheless, he disagreed that this is always true in every case because of his own experience. In chapter 28, he moves on to start talking about God's wisdom and offers this praise of God's wisdom. Again, many scholars also view that this chapter is out of place because the main subject in the preceding chapters has been the justice of God. And now we see it switch. In this chapter, the subject is wisdom. So does this mean a different speaker has suddenly started to talk? So one thing, some think that uh, this comes from the mouth of someone other than Job because of these differences. The subject matter, however, is in harmony with what Job had said previously. We can compare it to chapter 9, verses 10 and 11, chapter 12, verse 13, chapter 17 and verse 10. 23, 8 to 10. Wisdom is an issue that lies behind the problem of God's justice. If only people could find wisdom, they could understand God's justice. This seems to be an interlude, this chapter, which marks the transition between the two major parts of the poetic body. The previous dialogue between Job and his friends and the forthcoming long speeches by Job. We see that Job will speak from again from here in chapters 29 to 31. Then a chap by the name of Elihu will come in and speak from chapters 32 to 37. And then God will finally speak in chapters 38 to 41. The essence of wisdom is to fear or treat with reverential trust the Lord and to depart from evil. Neither Job nor his friends had been concerned with the fear of the Lord in their speeches. They merely wanted to prove their own point of view. Here, in this chapter, Job says he feared God and turned from evil. That Job believed God was unjust in his case. It didn't mean that he had abandoned faith in God completely. He just did not understand this situation. People have been extremely clever and quite industrious in exploring and discovering and extracting Earth's richest physical resources. But they haven't been able to do the same with God's wisdom. They don't spend as much time and effort and expense in trying to find God's wisdom. The reason for this is that wisdom does not lie hidden in the Earth but in God. The key to obtaining that wisdom is turning yourself properly towards God. We can never plumb the depths of God's wisdom. However, we can experience wisdom partially as we obey him, making him rather than self the centre of our lives and allowing him to regulate our lives. How do we find wisdom with God? Well, the first thing we need to do is to fear him. In chapter 28, Job gave evidence that he did fear God. In chapter 29, he proceeds to give evidence that he also turned away from evil. 
Consequently, the last verse in chapter 28, which is verse 28, is like a hinge, it is a connecting link. We can compare it to Psalm 110 and verse 11. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. All those who practice it have a good understanding. And also Proverbs chapter 1 and verse 7. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. The main point that we find from this is that we should not just be hearers, but also doers of God's word. So now in chapters 29 to 31, Job will again defend his innocence. He began this whole thing with a speech in chapter 3. When his suffering had come upon him, his friends came to visit. They sat in silence for seven days and Job finally spoke. Now at the end of their speeches, he ends with a speech. This whole speech is a concluding summary of his case and he delivered it as if he were in court. He made no reference to his three companions. He swears a vow of innocence and his oath forces the issue. God should either clear him or let the curses fall on him. In chapter 29, we'll see Job uses the personal pronoun I or me 52 times in the one chapter. But throughout this, there is no confession. There's no admission of failure. And we see nothing of a broken or contrite spirit in Job. So in verses 1 to 11 of chapter 29, we see that Job longed for the former days. Job's fellowship with God evidently meant the most to him, since he mentioned this blessing first. In verse 4 in particular, he speaks of the friendship of God being on his tent. There was domestic bliss. He enjoyed all the wealth that he had, the family that he had, and friends that he had. So domestically, everything was wonderful. In verse 7 to 11, he turns from his domestic situation to the way he was viewed socially. So Job turned from that bliss to this social happiness, the chief characteristic of which was his honour. Unlike God's present treatment of him, Job had assisted the injured and had punished the oppressors. Why isn't God or his friends helping him now he's in that situation? And in verses 12 to 25, he explained why he had enjoyed them. It was because he was so good. He was so wonderful. He enjoyed the, the wonderful home life that he had. He enjoyed the great social standing that he had because he was a good, righteous man. We see here a hint of his problem, and that is self-righteousness. In verses 18 to 20, a description of what he thought he was entitled to expect because of his prosperity is given. His former prosperity was because he was so wonderful. Job had also provided encouragement and comfort for those who were despondent, in contrast to his friends. So Job's review of his life in this chapter is actually one of the most important documents in scripture for the study of patriarchal ethics. The law hadn't been given, he didn't know Moses, but there certainly seemed to be a code of practice for these people who served God. Whilst chapter 29 speaks of what the Lord gave to Job in the past, chapter 30 speaks of what the Lord took away in the present. Compare it to chapter 1 and the things that we saw and, and how he lost them. And we see the words, but now. But now he is hated, in verse 1. Now they laugh at me. In verse 9, now he is tortured. And now I have become their song. I am a byword to them. The young would uh, uh, stand and, and move out of the way when he came along and walk through. The older people would stand in his presence and respect him for his wisdom. But those things is just a joke to them now. And in verse 16, worst of all, now he's been cut off from God. 
Now my soul is poured out within me. Days of affliction have taken uh, hold of me. Listening to Job, he was boasting about the outstanding man he'd been. Now he's courting sympathy and blaming God for the bad things that have come upon him, because it's obviously not his fault. So he continues a bit of complaint that God will not hear his case. In chapter 31, he gives his oath of innocence. Job concluded his defence with this oath. And note the frequent repetition of the phrase, if I have, and the, the equivalent. There are six main claims that are made here by Job. He says he is untainted by immorality in the first 12 verses. This is followed by being untainted by thoughtlessness. He was a thoughtful person. He cared about others and, and responded to their needs. He was untainted by covetousness verses 24 and 25. Untainted by secret worship of idols. He, he didn't worship these idols behind everyone else's back just in case there was something in it, in verses 26 to 28. He was untainted by bitterness toward his enemies, verses 29 to 32. And he was untainted by insincerity. Here we have proof that Job really was what God described him as, blameless and upright, fearing God and turning away from evil, as we saw way back in chapter 1 and verse 1. Now we understand better why God could boast about Job to Satan in verse 8 and then again in chapter 2 and verse 3. Look at this list. See the kind of man he is is the best that God's got. And we also see how groundless his friend's criticisms of him were. This chapter is one of the most remarkable descriptions of what it means to be a righteous person. Well, we have something similar to work from from us today. In chapter 31, we could compare the statements that are made there with things seen in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 5, and in particular from verses 21 to 48. Job did what Jesus commanded in the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus said that God expects obedience to the spirit of his law, not just obedience to the letter of it. In other words, don't just not do it, you aren't taught to think about doing it either. So Job began by explaining the principles by which he had lived. He claimed purity from ethical defilement in two ways, and he referred to the binding covenant that he had made with his eyes. And let's face it, those things that are a delight to the eye are very often those things that might cause us to sin. That's the way it's been from the beginning, way back in Genesis. And in James, we're told it's still the way it is today. Then he used the oath form. If such and such be true, then let so and so happen. And we can see throughout this chapter, the verses that we read, where he will say, if I have done this, then let that happen to me. He wouldn't be so bold as to do that if he wasn't confident that he had not actually sinned in the way he was being accused of. The idea that he made a covenant with his eyes. Those that would keep their hearts pure have to guard their eyes. These are the outlets and inlets of cleanness. And by eyes, it really means the mind. What goes into our mind, however it goes into our mind, and what we dwell on and what we think about. Job lived in monogamy. If so, he was even superior to Abraham in this aspect of his righteousness. Most of the 14 sins that Job mentioned in this chapter weren't heinous, terrible crimes, but relatively minor deviations from what would be the ethical ideal. They were covert rather than overt iniquities. And in this, Job claimed innocence on the highest level of morality. And as I say, if we read 
the Sermon on the Mount, we'll see just what an outstanding character he really was to be able to say that he's done all of those things. Note also that he continued to assume that God punishes the wicked. He's still pointing his finger at others who commit such things and he says they are to be judged but he cannot see why he should be judged so severely when he's such a wonderful person. Notice Job talks about adultery in verses 9 to 12 and these words are, are something that reveal righteous abhorrence at that sin. Likewise his statements regarding the importance of treating slaves as human beings in verses 13 to 15 reveal Job's fear of God and love for his fellow man. Everything we see in Job are the commandments that we're told to follow. Love God, love your fellow man. He respected human life highly. We notice from verses 16 to 23 of chapter 31. All his life he had taken care of the poor and needy, and he had not taken advantage of the vulnerable, such as orphans. Job further claimed that he had not taken excessive delight in possessions and was not an idolater. He had not rejoiced when his enemies suffered. He had not withheld hospitality from strangers. So it wasn't the fact that he just didn't do things. He also made sure he did the right things. He had not covered up his sins. He wasn't a hypocrite. There's nothing in the background, as his friends are accusing him of, that they don't, didn't see. Job's cry for a hearer of his claims appears again. But in verse 35, this probably implied God rather than the mediator he'd requested earlier. He wants to stand before God and make his case before him. God is all seeing and all knowing and he knows. So why can't he appear before him and talk about it? So in summary, what he's been saying is that he's innocent. So why is he suffering? Job had claimed innocence in his personal life. He had claimed innocence towards the way he treated his neighbor. He was innocent in the way he had behaved correctly towards God. But Job's friends believe that God always punishes sin. Job is being punished through his suffering. Therefore, it means he is a sinner. They just can't listen to what he says when for them the evidence is clear. Yet we know full well the evidence that he's a good man is also clear. Why are they not taking note of that? We also see that Job believed that God was punishing him when he was innocent. Therefore, he's thinking God was being unfair. The answer still eludes all of them. They're talking at cross purposes. What will God have to say about all this?